Hi, everybody. It's Todd Conklin, and this is the Pre-Accident Podcast. I am your ever incomparable and uh, nearly capable host for today's beautiful podcast. And let's just get this out of the way early. I pretty much predict, 100% prediction, here it comes, that you're going to want to hear more of this next guy. Today's guest is amazing. He's remarkable, and you're going to love him. His name's uh, Jim Barker. Uh, James R. Barker, if you must, and he's a uh, he is uh, a college professor. In fact, he's the Herbert S. Lamb Chair in Business Education at Dalhousie University in uh, Nova Scotia, in Canada. He's remarkable, and part of the reason he's so remarkable is because he has this this almost uncanny ability to discuss really really interesting topics in a way that you almost instantly understand them. In fact, let me remove the word almost. You will instantly understand them. And the topic that he's going to talk about, because he's really interested in it, is complexity. And he's going to talk about complexity in organizations, and he does it in such a way that you'll leave this conversation really with three very distinct bullet points, and they're words you will use, have used, going to use, and will use to talk about your organization in a very profitable way. This guy is remarkable. You're going to love it. He's also really fun. Now, I had to catch him by Skype because Nova Scotia is really far away, and the weather is crappy. And uh, we spent quite a bit of time in this conversation talking about how crappy the weather is. Sit back and enjoy this. I actually think you're going to find this conversation probably as important as any conversation we'll have. And it's remarkably important if you're interested in this new view stuff. Jim is really special. And he's special because he's just so good at this. But he's also special because he's thought about this in a way that we can use it. Now, he's not coming from the safety side. In fact, he's a, he's a management guy. But I think that's who we spend most of our time working with. And the fact that he does lots and lots of work, he makes lots of little MBAs and produces them and spreads them throughout the world. That'll help us, I think, a lot in this conversation. So let's not talk much more about it. Let's jump right in, kind of as it's going. This is uh, this is James Barker. This is Jim, and Dr. Jim's going to take us on a discussion around the notion of complexity. Yeah, what would you end up doing with the ideas? Have you? Oh, I'm still, still clicking away on them, man. I've got a whole suite of, well, it's mostly exec ed things. Yeah, but I think that exec ed stuff is – I mean, I can tell you that your model is a direct crossover. I mean, it works perfectly for yeah. for what we talk about. I mean, that whole complexity thing is really interesting. Uh, but, I, I mean, I'm just, I keep working it and refining it, and, and but I mainly pitch it. I mean, I worked it into my MBA classes now. Yeah, which is perfect. Uh-huh. How do they like it? Oh, they seem to, I mean, it seems to work pretty well. I mean, they can grasp it and they can work with it. Do you feel but, like – do you That's feel like, what I'm about. I mean, it's about it's uh, the thrust of the idea is that you move with complexity rather than trying to run up against it or manage it. Do you feel uh, like you have to battle against kind of the classic Newtonian worldview that those guys carry in, especially at the MBA le- level? Of course. I mean, that's just part. That's just part of it. Uh, but that. But that's what I. That's what I. That's what I do. I, I come at that early, uh, and that, I've got a few things that I draw on. Uh, I'll send you a link to another video. It's by a friend of mine from uh, University of Colorado, Paul, called uh, Matt Koshman. Uh, but it's 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 not really about complexity per se, but it's about how the organization's this complex communicative relationship thing. And, and anyway, I start with that idea, and then I just go go from there to uh, uh, you know how you think about the organization differently, and how then you have to think about change differently, and and. Then you know, try to just integrate stuff. So I keep evolving and keep keep working on it, but it's mainly presents itself in these executive education kind of classes. Talk to me a little more about how you how because you look at the organization in a complex model, how it changes how you look at a change in a complex model. I I thought that was really good. Well, the idea is is 
the basic idea, because while well, we use this word that says that uh, change is constant, and that, that's sort of this default thing that we go to when we don't really understand what's going on with change, or we get baffled by change. So we say, well, well change is constant. So that, that's kind of a throwaway line that we have. But we never really do anything with it because essentially the Newtonian or the, the economic views or the psychological view, whichever viewpoint you want to take, uh, they can't deal with fluidity. They're not equipped to deal with the organization as something that's, that's constituted moment by moment. Uh, you know, what becomes real in the organization is a function of the present moment, what's happening in the present moment, and, and who's there in the present moment. So things are very fluid. The organization's fluid. The example that I use, it's like a, a river. Uh, you know, you, you, if you stand on the bank and look at a river, and then turn your head and look away, turn back and look at the river again, everything's changed, but yet it still looks incredibly the same. So organizations are like that. You know, you know, if you look at the organization from one level, everything's pretty much the same. It's just going on. It's creating value. But if you look at it different, and everything differs moment by moment, but yet it still works. It still creates value. So we never ask ourselves, how does that happen? We keep plugging away with, with very uh, linear kinds of models, and we don't really have, try to understand the organization and what it means to understand the organization as something that's fluid. And I like fluid better than nonlinear. Uh, we start using the word nonlinear, and then people start to get sidetracked when something does appear in a linear kind of way. Uh, but if you if you embrace the idea about fluid and you're trying to move with that fluidity, uh, then then you're much better equipped, I think, to to make things happen in the organization. So I think that's brilliant because you're exactly right. As soon as I start talking about nonlinear systems, and then a machine fails then I'm screwed. I mean, because then, I mean, that's absolutely kind of, it, when things happen in a linear fashion, it sort of messes up your metaphor. So fluid's way better. And there is, uh, there is a very powerful linear pro element that often gets overlooked uh, from the complexity side, and that's time. Uh, yeah, we kind of forget about time. But time time's kind of made, it's kind of made up though, isn't it? Well, of course it's made up. I mean, it's, over, it's an overlay to help us make sense about what's going on, but we all do it. It's something that all human beings can relate to because we're, you know, we're getting older, as an example. Excuse me. We, because, uh, hello. <laughs> well, we all this? age, and so we Not, understand time, really and hard. we understand that time moves, time goes forward. So the linear quality, the primary linear quality, is that, is that the organization is going forward through time. And, and, and you have to appreciate that. You have to appreciate that, that in the organization, we go forward. The organizations move forward through time just like we as human beings move forward through time. Now, of course, time's a human creation to, to explain, uh, you know, to help us make sense of reality. And it's very useful for that. To explain wrinkles and gray hair. Yeah. Well, but, but it does. Yeah. But, but, but it's so useful because we can experience it. You know, we can experience getting older, and we can experience how the concept of time helps us explain that. So what we have to grasp in the organization is that the organization is moving forward through time, creating value. And that's, that's, that's an intense pressure. We have to move. Uh, and where uh, this idea really crystallized for me, Todd, was in what you talk about. When you talk about how human beings will do what they have to do to be productive. Right, right, right. So if we're cutting corners around safety, we're not doing that because... We're lax or we don't care. We're doing it to be productive. There's tremendous pressure to be productive. And that sense of productivity is very time focused. Uh, you know, if you remember a story that you like to tell about the, uh, uh, the assembly line and, and the technician on the assembly line who's trying to, 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 to fix the assembly line and finally gets so upset by the inability to fix it that he actually tries to pick it up and, and <coughs> excuse me, pick it up and shift it. Well, what's driving that? What's driving that? Is that the dog on assembly lines down? There's no value being created because nobody else can do anything with it. And he's feeling an intense amount of pressure to get the dang thing going again. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And, and so, so we don't appreciate the linear pressure of time and what it does to us in the organization and how it affects our experience of the organization. So, but that's where things, you know, that's where people start to struggle with the complexity part because they, they want to think linear, nonlinear. 
and and that's that's useful to move us or you know our thinking about about movement in certain ways but yet we forget that it's not this this absolute it's it's either linear or it's nonlinear it's how we think about it and you know so we think in linear models we don't think in in models that that embrace fluidity because fluid i mean cuz it's because it doesn't meet our frame. It doesn't meet our schema. I mean, it's hard to think that way because we don't have the schema for that. Well, we're not given. We're not taught schemas for it. We're taught, you know, we're taught cause effect kinds of schemas. And we're good at them. Dang it, we're good at them. How's the uh, how's the stuff working with the pharmacy stuff? Uh, it's uh, haven't got to the point where I can integrate a lot of what I'm doing into the pharmacy thing yet. Uh, it would be something that that we'll get to. Right now, the biggest the stuff that we're working on primarily on the pharmacy thing is. Uh, uh, integrating in, uh, and, and or well, there's a network for reporting errors, and we're trying to see how well that network works. So the main study I'm involved in right now is really just an assessment of is a is the network working or not? Are people reporting errors on it? Uh, what are they saying? And, and is there any uptake of, of what's out there on that network? Interesting. Well, I get there, but uh, uh, you know, still a few years down the road before. That kind of research is ready for this. Interesting, interesting. Who are you reading? What are you thinking? Uh, well, I'm thinking right now about uh, uh, so, when you want to start this. Are you recording now? Or? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're, we're going. Okay. <laughs> I, I should have told you we were going. I, I'm not very good at this. It's all, kind of, it's <laughs> all, right, all pretty new to me. Sorry about that. Oh, that's fine. No, no, no. It's, it's, just, a con- <laughs> it's just a conversation, so it's pretty, okay. it's pretty conversational. Uh, uh, well, so what am I thinking about right now? And what am I reading uh, things right now? Uh, I found some, uh, you know, there's some things that I like uh, that are floating around up there, but I, I, I buddied up with a guy from uh, uh, Wisconsin called Phil Clampett, and he's been around for a long time, uh, and he does a lot of consulting work. He's, a, he's an academic, but does a, a reasonable amount of consulting work. But he writes a lot about complexity uh, and and what managers do with complexity, but he, but he's not a complexity scholar, so he doesn't use the word. But what he writes about is a lot about uh, the how we move forward and how we fo- how we structure a communication system so that we move forward. And that's got me thinking a lot right now. What I'm thinking about right now is what what are the kinds of things that we do that creates conditions for us to be effective. And I think that's what's important. What you have to do as a manager. Uh, a lot of your job as a manager are creating conditions. Uh, and it's conditions so that you increase the likelihood that something good will happen in that fluid environment. Wow, that's, ama- you know, that's amazing because that's, that's where I am right now, too. I spend most of my time uh, certainly on event investigation, event understanding, and event learning, asking them to identify the conditions that were present uh, in order yeah. to create the environment where the failure could happen. That's remarkable. Go on. Uh, but that's what goes on in any kind of business environment. There's this, there, there are set of conditions, and those conditions affect the probability of, of, of events happening. Now, you've got to be careful when we talk about probability in humans. Uh, because, yeah. and, and you talk about this, I know, too. But, but you know, having a 70% uh, uh, feel of confidence that, that, that you've got the conditions in place for something good to happen is about as good as you're going to get. Uh, and, and you know, we're taught not to like that, but, but that's how it is. So, you, so we're continually working to try to get that 70% solution. But what, what we have to do, though, what, what we try to do, we try to put things in place like if, you get the right, if, if you're trying to solve a problem in the organization and you as a manager can get the right two people together in the room to talk about it, well, chances are, meaning that you probably hit the 70% solution that you can get something creative coming out of that conversation. Now, you might not. They might not be able to talk or work things out together. But, uh, but you're still working about 70% that if you got the right two people with the right understanding of the problem, sitting down together and you created the conditions for them to talk, you know, again, you probably get something useful coming out of that. So, so we don't really, again, we don't like that as managers because we're taught that we should be at 100%. We should, you know, understand everything exactly. And, that, you know, we, we like to think we're very comforted in thinking that way, but that's not how reality works. Reality works in terms of, 
of 70% probability. It's not 100% probability. And 70% is still relatively high probability. I mean, that's that's certainly operationally significant. There's plenty of numbers. Oh, yeah. Uh, it is, but that, but that is also more of how we work. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, we are, you know, again, you like to talk about people driving and, and examples of people driving, how they make decisions. You know, driving is one of the most complex things that, that any of us ever do. But notice how good we are at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think of that we're, a lot, actually. Yeah, we're really good at at this sense of of... of what works right now, and we're good at that, and 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 we're we're naturally good at that because we're naturally good at dealing with complex environments. We just don't we don't teach ourselves enough about them to understand how good we are with them and to maximize the things that we're good about. But but you know, we're we're really good at at estimating situations and uh, uh, trying to you know trying to make sense of them and then and then acting. One of the things that I, that I talk about a lot, uh, particularly in my beginning MBA class, uh, that I don't talk, uh, or that, that uh, uh, I'm just now trying to, trying to frame up exactly how I want to present it, is, for lack of a better way, Todd, I call them qualitative managerial skills, because in, in nice. the uh, MBA that's, class, it's easy to contrast it to quantitative skills. Oh, that's nice. I like that anyway. That's uh, nice, actually. I, I, it's not as workable of a term as I would like it to be. It's pretty elegant. I like it. But what I talk about, I talk about you know, you know, the three basic qualitative skills that all managers have to have, uh, and those help us put together, those help us bring the rest of the knowledge that we know, the more quantitative, factual knowledge, uh, that helps us leverage that knowledge to, to do good things, so like create conditions for success to occur. So I talk about uh, situational awareness, I talk about sense making. Right, good. I talk about persuasion. Nice. And and those are and if we think about the art, what, what we like to call the art of management. Essentially, those are the three things that the art of management involves. Now, situational awareness scares me because it's got that's that's clearly a term of art, you know, and and it's used a lot retrospectively as a weapon. Like if somebody fails, one of the reasons at least I see a lot that they failed is because they weren't situation they were not situationally aware. Well then what appeals that? Um well I mean I think I think to me it's 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 condition sensitive. Uh, I'm not situationally aware but condition aware but I don't, that's not very elegant and doesn't sound very interesting. Right. But I think that there are and I understand what you're saying. I understand why it scares you. But I also think though that we can do things uh to enhance our ability to appreciate what's going on in a situation. Yeah. Particularly under particularly teaching ourselves to look for consequences. You know, we teach ourselves really well to look for outcomes. We do not teach ourselves how to look for consequences. And consequences are very important when we understand if we're trying to understand a fluid organization. You know, everything in the organization, all the human beings, everything that we do are forces of nature. We all are. We all have consequences. We do anything, there's a consequence. Uh, what we don't know is, you know, is it, is it a positive or a negative consequence? We have to make sense of the consequence before you can say that. So what, what we don't teach people well enough to do is to understand consequences, when consequences are occurring. And could we rephrase consequence into the word risk? Well, it's the same thing. Yeah, that, that's what I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, this is all, management is really all, I mean, that's the next step you get to as well, which I do that some of the MBA classes. You know, management is all about risk and, and managing risk, you know, since. What I do in the MBA classes is I, I, I uh, because I understand finance so well, that I talk about things like derivative markets, uh, and uh, we look at currency uh, trends. Currency trends actually are a good one to understand the linear effect of time, but how things still move in nonlinear sorts of ways across time. Couldn't agree with you more. In fact, I think uh -huh. all all the good risk information right now is coming out of economics for sure. Yeah. But but but, it's, but you know, looking at, at at currency fluctuation tables are, are a useful way to understand that point. But uh, <coughs> so I was talking about derivatives. Uh, you know, derivatives essentially what you're doing. You're trying to look into the future and 
and make a calculation as to as to how a particular phenomenon will move in the future and where it might be uh, uh, with all the risks and stuff that are that are involved in it. So I talk about those kinds of concepts to help people understand consequences and and to look for consequences. That's remarkable. Uh, where I came, or a lot of where I came to this is out of Decker's view of drift. Yeah, isn't which, that great. Which is, which is very important. Well, what what it's very important because you can't understand drift unless you are looking for consequences. Because you 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 know that that you have a high likelihood of drifting. That that's standard, and I, and I, I get that very quickly from Decker's work, and I understand why drift occurs. But how do you recognize that you're drifting? You can only recognize the drifting if you have a degree of sensitivity to consequences. Yeah, it's the only it's the only way drift makes sense, really. It's the only way you can drift. So so you have to you have to be you have to do things that enhance your degree of situational awareness and, and things that are happening in a situation. You also have to enhance your ability to make sense of it, particularly applying uh, various heuristics. And, and if you start thinking about heuristics, then, then management knowledge becomes meaningful in a different kind of way. You know, if, you, if you stop looking at management knowledge as giving you these uh, prescriptive models to use and start looking at it as giving you heuristics for making sense, then uh, uh, it becomes much more useful. And I mentioned this, this uh, person, Clampett, Phil Clampett, uh, what Phil does is uh, what's what I like. He really focuses on in his management books, providing heuristics, you know, tools, frameworks. But they're mainly used just for making sense. So you see something happening. How do you make sense of it? Uh, a good example is is the standard cost benefit analysis. Sure. Uh, I use cost benefit analysis a lot again on the MBA level because people come from economics, finance, they can understand it. But we talk about how we use cost benefit analysis all the time, just without numbers. You know, much of our decision making, our quick in the moment decision making, are very quick cost benefit analysis. Wow, that's good. So that, but that, but that's my thing about you. But that's what we do. Oh, you're absolutely right. It's just you, know, so, you but, just but have, that, you have this amazing ability to talk about things in such an approachable way. Good on you. <laughs> but that, but that is so. So that's again, you know, it, it's it's less you know, giving people this newness and these ideas. It, it's sort of reframing how we look at things. So, so, if, so if we, you know, if, if we reframe situational awareness by trying to teach ourselves to see consequences and to be alert for consequences, if we reframe sense making to think about how we apply heuristics to make sense of, of what we're seeing right in front of us right now, but then we have to do something with it. You know, we, we have to we have to generate movement. We meaning managers, you know, or anybody, but we have to generate movement. And so how do we generate movement? Well, we persuade other people to move in the direction that we need them to move in. And that, that's, that, that's where that, it, persuasion is, is such a human attribute. Uh, and we've known that for a long, long time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but again, we don't, we don't teach it really anymore. Uh, we, don't seek to, we don't seek to learn how exactly we go about persuading. And, and uh, I try to keep it simple. I try to wrap persuasion around three things. And they come out of, or two of them come out of Fisher's narrative view of persuasion, which I think is very good. The good thing about Walter Fisher's, this Walter Fisher's narrative view of persuasion, is that it's very culturally sensitive. Right, and it's brilliant. I agree with you completely. Uh, but so, he, so he talks about, uh, he talks about uh, fidelity and, and temporal movement. Uh, fidelity, fidelity, and fidelity, and uh, you don't have to pause it for a second. Let me look this up. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think what the three values are of Fisher's. It's it's message fidelity, moves over time, logically hangs together. I can't remember what. Oh, it is. yeah, that's it. That's it. it it's it's. Coherence. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. Right. So, so I was so so it has to be coherent. Meaning has to make sense. You know, because sense making is, is an important quality. So, so if you made sense of something as a manager, you have to communicate that sense of you know that sense of sense. 
you have to communicate that here what I want you to do makes sense. It's appropriate. You know, it's appropriate for what we're doing right now. And then it also has fidelity. You know, it, it's it's the way to think of it if, it, if it's coherent, we see this as the right value that we're supposed to create right now. And if it has fidelity, it's what you're telling us to do, the how to create the value is right as well. So you've got two th- key things are right, and these are little r right, not grand moral rights. It's what's right right now. Right, right, right. Uh, and so, so that's the crux of the argument. There's one, though, there's a third element that's important for the organization, and that is, is it's actionable. And that means that if, if I'm trying to persuade you to do something as a manager, Todd, you've got to be able to do it. <coughs> Excuse me. You've got to have the resources, you've got to have the capability, the capacity, all that. But that's, that's the way that you judge it. You know, can you do something with it? You know, so if I'm telling you, all right, Todd, you know, I, need, I need you to work overtime today. Uh, I need you to work overtime because a shipment was delayed coming in. The trucks have been delayed because of ice on the road. Trucks aren't going to get here until 4. I need you to work at least until 7. Okay, that has a degree of coherence to it. Right, hangs that's together. <coughs> Then I say, now, of course, since you're working overtime, of course, you'll get time and a half, and I'll take care and make sure that that's done. Now have fidelity. But now can you do it? Uh, do you have to get the kids somewhere at, at 5 o'clock? Uh, what else is going on? Uh, is Are enough people going to be there to support you so that you can actually get the trucks unloaded when they show up? So, so even though the message has fidelity and has coherence, it still might not be doable, might not be actionable. Right. So in the organization, that's the third thing that comes in, the sense of, of actionability. So that's what I teach about persuasion. That's or right. Try to, keep, you know, try to keep it simple. Now, if, if you take that approach, too, you can look at all the more, you know, these more models that you see out there about persuading and how we persuade. Those make a lot better sense then, or it's a lot easier to use them. If you stay focused on persuasion around creating a message that has coherence, has fidelity, and is actionable. Oh, this is great. Hey, can we do this again someday? I sure. almost I can almost guarantee you that the feedback on this is going to be people are going to want to hear more of this. And there you got it. There you have it. That's Jim Barker. What'd you think? I'm awfully curious what you're thinking. A, a lot of information in those 20 minutes or so. Um r- remarkable how his work from the complexity side, especially from the management side, has led to conditions. And to a great extent, the work I'm doing, the work Bob's doing, Bob Edwards is doing, um, some of the work you see around with with Shane and Bill Rigo, um, Rob Fisher, really starting to identify and understand that conditions are identifiable. You can be aware of conditions because conditions are, are, in a sense, measurable. I love how he says fluidity as opposed to complex adaptive because I agree with him the idea that a complex system is knowable is a pretty good place to start the discussion but as soon as something linear happens within that complex system time was the example he used it sort of screws up your theory um, very very thoughtful stuff and when he gets into Walter Fisher's um, fidelity tests uh, that's really important stuff. I don't know what I'm thinking about around situational awareness. I, I think that word is pretty loaded for me. And because it's loaded, I think I react to it against it. Um, and that's probably not good, but that's kind of where I am. Uh, all in all, I, I, it's a great discussion. I, I enjoyed it immensely. As always, thanks for listening. Big thanks to Jim Barker for his time this morning. Hey, if you get a chance, tell your friends. That always helps. And subscribe to the podcast. That seems to be important to a lot of people. Until then, be safe.